Here we go. It says this. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the work. Somebody say, work it. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Hold up. Wait a minute. Can you help me preach? Can you look at somebody next to you and ask them, would you let Jesus spit on you? (laughs) Think about it. I mean, it's Jesus, but he spit. Isn't that wild? Can I tell you my answer? I would let Jesus spit on me, but it better work. Because if it don't work, we're going to have problems. <laughs> he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. So he went and washed and came back seen. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. We're thankful, God, that this is a move of God. God, you're just moving in this church. You're moving in our lives. And God, we're grateful that we get to play a part. God, we're grateful, God, for Baltimore County. God, how you are expanding our territory, using us to impact hundreds and thousands of lives. God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful. God, we don't care about the Super Bowl because the Ravens aren't playing. So please speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. At least that's how I feel. We are concluding a series today called Picture This. Somebody say, Picture This. Come on, Baltimore County. Picture This. Who, me? You? Who are we talking about? Picture This. And and here's the whole idea or the mindset behind this series is you have to have a picture of what you're believing God for. A lot of people, they have what they think is faith, but it's not really faith. It's fantasy. It's not really faith, it's wishing. I wish things will get better. I hope things will get better. Can I, can, hope doesn't move heaven. God doesn't respond to wishes. He responds to faith. With with faith, you can speak to a mountain and see it moved. And, And here's the thing about faith. Faith is specific. And for a lot of us, we're hoping and we're wishing that something's going to change, but we have no picture of what it looks like when it changes. And because we don't have a picture, we're never truly going to see it come to pass in our lives. Let me give you an example. I'm I'm believing that I'm going to have a great marriage. Awesome. What does that look like? What does that mean? Give, Give me something more than just great. Because if we have this ambiguous idea of what we want, we'll never know if we fully stepped into it. And if you don't know if you ever fully stepped into it, you don't know when to thank God for it. It's like, I had a good day. Does that mean he answered the prayer? Is it not? Is it this? Is it that? Or whatever maybe You need a picture of what you're believing God to do in every single area of your life. Two weeks ago, we talked about how for many of us, I dare say all of us, your picture is too small. You need to get away from the people around you that have small-minded thinking, are only expecting what their efforts can produce, and step out into the expanse of who God is. The Bible says no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive how great what God has in store for you. Somebody say amen. Amen. And then last week I said your picture's too big. I don't know why. I love messing with your head. It's too small. It's too big. And hear me, hear me, hear me. I want to clean up last week's message. There's no such thing as having faith that's too big. There's no such thing as having a dream or a goal that's too big. Here's what I was trying to say. Just make sure that you're sober. That you're not just so obsessed over the finish line that you're not focusing on what's the next step that God has for me. Yes, I'm believing that when I retire, I'm going to be a millionaire. But right now, I make 50K and I have $85,000 worth of debt. Forget the million. What's my next 
step to move towards the freedom that God has for me. Not one amen there, but that is okay. I'm going to keep on stepping across this foot. You need a picture. So as we conclude this series, I, I want to I preach a message. I probably should have started the series, but I'm all the way backwards, so I'll end this series with this. And that's, where do I start? Like, how do I start getting, where do I get a picture for this particular area of my life? Where do I get a picture for my marriage, a picture for my finances, for, for, for raising godly kids or, or growing in Christ or whatever it may be? One, one of my goals is to be a great husband. And because my wife is not sitting in this service, I'll just tell you I am accomplishing that goal. <laughs> and I promise you I'm not biased at all. But, but I, I, I try, and, you know, normally I'll, I'll, I'll be in here working during the week, nine, ten hours, or whatever it may be, and I'll, I'll try to kind of be a great husband. So when I'm finished with my work day, on my way home, I'll get in my car, and she's always the first phone call. I'll call her and say, hey, babe, I'm on my way home. Is there anything you would like me to pick up? Any great men in here, you know, you know, let me just call and just say, is there anything you need or whatever it may be? Here's the problem. Some of y'all already know. I don't really mean it. <laughs> Is that too honest? Like, I, I'm not really asking to stop. I'm just trying to be good and earn some brownie points. And if you could just go ahead and play the game with me and say, oh, no, babe, I don't need anything, that would be great. And normally she'll play the game with me. She'll say, no, I have everything. I control. Dinner's ready or whatever it may be. But ever so often she'll say, actually, and I'm like, Yes. And she's like, can you stop at the supermarket and grab whatever maybe? Now, now sometimes it's an easy mission. Get some apples. You, you know, no, bring some oil, cooking oil or whatever it may be. But ever so often, she has like this level five complicated mission that will destruct as soon as it's been recorded type deal. She'll say, hey, can you grab me some coconut shavings from, from Indonesia for my acai bowl? <laughs> and I'm like, can you translate? I have no idea what you just said. And, and listen, God's still working on me. I will be a humble man one day. Today just ain't that day. So she's like, do you understand? I'm like, I got it, I got, I got it, I got it. Then I go pull up to the supermarket, I get out of the car, I walk. Yo, you know they have 28 aisles in a supermarket? And every aisle has something different? And I'm walking up and down, I'm like, coconut shavings, coconut shavings. I'm in the fruit aisle, I'm in the frozen section, I'm like, I can't find anything. And there's people in uniforms who work there, but I just don't want to ask. So I'm walking around for 10 minutes, and then finally it's just like, just ask somebody, and I'll ask some guy or some girl, and they won't know. They've never even heard of it in their life, and we're sitting there clueless. The manager's there. We got a sniffing dog trying to find <laughs> It's just like, what in the world? And, and that's kind of was our pattern. So here's what I started to do. I'll call, hey, babe, do you need anything? She said, yes. Yeah. So, okay, what do you need? And she said, I need this, I need that. And here's what I'll say. Hey, send me a picture. Come on now. Send me a picture. You, you ever brought something home and it was the right thing, wrong brand? <laughs> How am I supposed to know that my 18-month-old doesn't wear size 2 diapers anymore? Pray for me. And then, no, I need you to be specific. Send me a picture, and I'm walking around that supermarket with this. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? this? This is what I need. Many of us are searching for things in our life that we don't have a picture of, and we don't even know where to start. I, I was reading a book by John Maxwell. John Maxwell is one of the leading business and leadership uh, uh, just gurus and authors really in the entire world. And what many people may not know is John Maxwell is actually a believer, a follower of Christ. He actually used to be a pastor. And he was writing in this book that there's four different types of leaders or four different types of people in the world. And, and I'm going to kind of just contextualize it for this message. That there's four categories that people fall into. And I'll just help you out. This first category is not good. It's not where anybody wants to be, but it's where we all have been before. He said the first category of people are people who don't know what they don't know. In other words, you're clueless, and you didn't even know that you were clueless. It's one thing that I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to figure it out. It's another thing to realize, you know, I had no clue that I had no clue. For example, the first time I had a child, 
I didn't realize that I had no clue. I'm just like, you know, people raise these things all the time. Like, <laughs> how hard can it be? <laughs> Until you, they sleep, you give them a bottle, you change their diaper, mom's gone, and they won't stop crying. <laughs> and it's just like, what to do, what to do, what to do, what to do? You're clueless, and you didn't even know that you were clueless. All of us fall in that category in some area of our life. Some of us, we don't know that we don't know anything about finances. I just thought I'd just make money and pay bills, and as long as I got some at the end of the month, I'm doing okay. No, 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 no. There's wisdom. There's, there, there, there's, there's maturity. There's strategy to building and stewarding what God's given you. Some of us may not realize, but we're clueless in the area of relationships. That's next week, huh? Huh? Some of us are clueless on how to have a healthy argument. I'm going. Some people honestly have never heard the word healthy and argument in the same conversation. You think all disagreements are bad and ungodly, and that's not true. There's something about having a good, healthy, what I call fellowship. <laughs> Come on, now, I'm clu- the, the second category are people that John Maxwell says they know that they don't know. It's like, I don't know, but I know that I don't know, so I'm seeking out wisdom. That's why all of you are in church today, because you know there is some parts of God that I don't know, but I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to experience more and more of him, and that's a good place to be. You may not know, but at least you know that you don't know, and you're pursuing that wisdom and that knowledge. The third category of prayer, he said, are people who know what they do know. In other words, I've been walking with God for a while. I don't know everything, but I know something. I I, I may not know how to be the best dad. I don't have any kids yet, but when it comes to building a real estate portfolio, I know how to do that. I know how to flip houses, or I know how to do this. I know how to do that or whatever. Hear me, every single person in this room, there's something that you do know. And can I say it this way? There's something that you have to offer. And sometimes, even in church, we only come in a consumer position of what can I get, what can I get, what can I get. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of wisdom that you can get, but there's also a lot that you can give. And I believe God's ultimate picture for the church is not just come get, 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 but it's almost like this barter system, which is why we've set up connect groups the way that we have, is say, hey, I don't have a great marriage, but I do know how to invest. I can teach you how to invest if you can teach me how to build a great marriage. Or, hey, I don't quite know how to raise godly kids. I only have a one-year-old and I'm just learning, but I do know how to lead a great business. And I can lead a leadership connect group if somebody else can lead a parenting connect group. And there's this barter of wisdom and godly. Could you imagine what the church would become if we weren't just building our own lives, but we were building each other? Hmm? The Bible says somebody that waters other people themselves will be watered or refreshed. The last category, and this is where we all want to get, John Maxwell said there's certain people who you don't know what you do know. In other words, you've been walking in wisdom for so long. You've been applying God's word to your life for so long. You don't even know how much you know because you do it through muscle memory. You ever been around people that, that, that when they talk, your mind is just blown? Like, they're just, yeah, you know, I was just thinking about this, and then I bought this investment and flipped it over here and avoided taxes here and did this. And you're like, wait! (laughs) Slow down. So you did what? And then what? And what happened next? Like a soap opera. And then what? And what happened? And I'm telling you, there is something that God has given you that you do it out of muscle memory, but it can be a blessing to somebody around you. God is saying, listen, you need a picture for every area of your life. How, how do I get that picture? I'm so glad you asked. Can you, can you write this down? If you have your sermon notes there in your worship guide and you could fill in those blanks, write it on your phone or whatever it may be. Statistics show that people who write notes in church are 79.8% more likely to make it into heaven. <laughs> statistics also show that 88% of all statistics are made up. So you can take that for whatever. The first thing I want you to write down is this. Don't accept the guilt. Don't accept the guilt. If you're going to get a picture for your life, here's the first place you want to start. Don't accept the guilt. All right, I'm going to pause. I'm about to take this message and we're about to crank it into fourth gear. We ain't in sixth gear yet, but we're going fourth. Y'all ready to go there? 
Here we go. This passage that we just read, this blind man, that Jesus sees him and comes to him. Jesus is getting ready to heal him. Look what his disciples say. They say, Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind? Did he sin? He was born that way. He didn't even have time to sin. Or was it his parents' sin that he was born this way? Can, can I say it this way? What did his parents do wrong for them to bring this pain, this judgment, their curse, this curse into their life? Question for you. How come every time something goes wrong, every time there's some type of pain or tragedy, our first reaction is blame? Yeah. Whose fault is this? This week has been, I don't know if I've had an emotional week like this in a long time with the passing of Kobe Bryant and the rest of those that were on that helicopter. I'm sure many of you were affected by that. And, and I'm not going to lie, I was surprised how much I was affected by it. Like, I, I, don't, I don't have a relationship with the Bryants. I don't know them from Adam. But just imagine that sudden tragedy, the other family. I mean, it just rocked my world. I haven't done this in probably a long time. I had to delete my Instagram. Like, I could not deal with all the, the, the memories and all the different people. And I know they were honoring him, but every time I saw it, just this wave of emotion came over. And it actually happened last Sunday. We were was in between our, our services. 1.45 had just ended. I was kind of resting up before the four. And like many of you, your phone started blowing up. And I flipped the TV on, and something frustrated the life out of me. Here it is, they're trying to figure out what, what, what happened. They don't even know who was on the helicopter yet or whatever it may be. And they're already talking about whose fault was it. What, what, what the pilot did this, and, and then the air traffic control, and, and then they checked this, and they checked that, and all. And they're just trying to, who's to blame? Who do we go after? And I'm like, look, there, somebody may have made a mistake, and we'll figure out that letter. But how about a little bit of sympathy? How about a little bit of empathy? How about, how about we just mourn and figure all that out later? What is it about humanity that we want to blame somebody for everything that goes wrong? It's, it's my dad's fault. It's my mom's fault. It's the government's fault. It's, it's my fault. It's God's fault. Here's what I believe that desire to blame everything that goes wrong comes from. I believe it comes from a faulty worldview. I believe we have a perception of the world that is not true. And here's our perception. I think we believe that in the world, good things always happen and bad things are an anomaly. So if anything bad happens, someone must have caused it or some dumb, done something wrong because bad things are not normal. They're not average. They're not expected. That's not true. The Bible said that in seven days God created the earth, and on the seventh day he said, it is good. What I've done, what I've created was good. But as you know, Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God, and with that sin came death. You know what that means? From that moment came tsunamis, came floods, came cancer, and diabetes, and scoliosis, and all these different things that are destroying the temples that God made. With the fall of humanity, or the sin that entered the world, came brokenness, and it's been that way ever since. Bad is not an anomaly. Bad is a natural byproduct of this broken world that we live in. Matter of fact, it is good that is the anomaly. The Bible says this in John chapter 9, verse 5. Jesus said this, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In other words, Jesus says, it's me that brings all hope and all good in the world. Outside of me, there would be nothing but darkness. Can I tell you why your worldview matters? Because if you think that bad is an anomaly and good is taken for granted, then you're going to take the author of good, the source of good, God himself, for granted as well. For example, none of us wake up in the morning and say, God, I'm so glad I have my job today. God, I'm so glad that, that my body is healed and there's no sickness. God, here's another day that you've blessed me with health, that you've blessed me with prosperity. I'm grateful. You know what you do when you wake up? You hit the snooze button. <laughs> You roll back over, and then you drive to work grumbling about how I got to deal with it. Now, I don't grumble because I work here. But <laughs> make sense? But let us wake up and lose our job. Let us wake up, and, and there's some type of sickness in our body. Our first thought is, God, how could you? God, wait, I've had great church attendance. God, I'm a tither. God, this, God, that, or whatever. Maybe. And he said, don't you understand? I've had you under protection every single day of your life. I have been good to you over and over and over and over again. And you didn't even realize it because you took it for 
granted. He wasn't born blind because anybody sinned. He was born blind because we live in a broken world and bad things happen. In other words, Jesus said this, don't worry about whose fault it was, but just understand this is an opportunity for me to show how awesome and powerful, for me to move supernaturally in my life. One of the reasons why it's so difficult for us to admit, Khalil, I'll just tell you because nobody else can handle this. I don't know what I'm doing. That's really hard to say. I don't know how to be a great husband. I don't know how to be a dad. I don't know how to manage these fights. I don't know what it looks like to be a man of God. You know why it's so hard to say those things or even to think those things? Because of the guilt that comes flooding in. Because to admit that we don't have a picture for a particular area of our life makes us feel less than because I should know it's my fault. Why is it your fault? Well, I should know. How would you know? There was nobody to teach you. Oh, well, it was my dad's fault. He didn't teach me. It was my mom's fault. It was this, it was that. Really? Or maybe they just didn't have anybody to teach them. Come on now. Can we stop sending blame and just say, hey, the world's a messed up place. We're so grateful that we have a God that can turn things back right side up. There's always time to take responsibility, but there is never time to take blame. Second thing is this, write this down, write this down. The first thing is this, don't accept the guilt. Because when, because here's the thing, when you get over the guilt, you're able to say, hey, I don't know. And it doesn't make me less than, it just makes me human. And now I need to know. Can you teach me? I, somebody knows. I need to figure out where do I learn this. The second thing is this. Let Jesus work. You got to make a decision that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not worry about whose fault it is. I'm just going to seek the vision and the picture that I need for this area of my life. But when I get there, I'm going to let him work. I love this part. The Bible says that Jesus saw the man who was blind and he went to him. There's nowhere in the passage where it says this blind man, no offense, saw Jesus coming and said, Jesus, can no, he didn't see him. Jesus saw him first. Here's what that tells me, that Jesus is looking for me long before I was looking for him. Some of you are in church right now, you don't want to be here. You're only here because somebody guilted you into being here or, you know, you owed somebody something or whatever it may be. And you're checking your phone and texting. You're just like, man, I can't wait to get out of here. This is weird. This is awkward. thought I was going to church. Dude got Timberlands on like he's from Baltimore. I don't know what's going on. Like, what in the world is... (laughs) Here's what I've discovered. Even when you're not looking for Jesus, Jesus is looking for you. Maybe you're in here and you've been a Christian for 15 years and you are comfortable in your relationship with God, but truth be told, you're not pursuing God with desperation. Hear me, even though you're not desperate for him, he is desperate for you. He is looking to move supernaturally in your life. Jesus says, bring that man. He was born blind. I think he had given up on all hope of restoring his sight. It's one thing when you had something and you lost it. It's completely different when you never had it to begin with. How can I even hope for something that I've never experienced in my life before? I've never had family. How could I hope for family when I don't even know what to hope for? They bring this blind man to Jesus, and I could just, I could just imagine, because Jesus got a little bit of reputation now, okay? Like, he raises the sick, he heals the sick, he, 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 he feeds 5,000 with five loaves and two bread. Like, there was a level of excitement, because everybody knew what was about to happen. They bring this man to Jesus, and Jesus is there, and Peter's like, watch this, watch this. Watch what my Messiah can do. And they're, ready, they're getting ready for Jesus to pray, to lay hands, and next thing you know, <sighs> Can you imagine, Peter? <laughs> you need a tissue? No, I'm good. I'm good. <sighs> Can you imagine being the blind man? <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, you hear, <sighs> and the blind man's like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. The next thing you hear is, I wish the Bible had slow motion. (laughs) And it's just like, 
I'll ask you again, would you let Jesus spit on you? Would you let Jesus take a spit mud pie and put it on your eyes? Somebody say, let him work. I'm just going to talk about me. I'm not going to talk about you, and you can just kind of fit in under this bus where I am. Oftentimes when I pray and I ask God to do something in my life, I'm not just praying and asking him to do something in my life. Laced in that prayer is an instruction manual of how I want him to do it. You know what I mean? It's like, God, can you do this? But it's really in your mind, you're like, God, here's how I want you to do this. Hypothetically, maybe you're married and you're just, you're just not having a great time in your marriage and you're, you've been praying 21 days, God. We're praying for joy, God. We're praying that you would restore our marriage. God, I'm praying for a breakthrough in my marriage. That's what your words are. Can I tell you what your heart really is? God, break that man down. <laughs> Come on now. God, humble him. God, make him weep in your presence. God, show yourself strong. Come on, don't lie to me. Come on now. You're praying for favor at your job? What you're really praying is, God, fire my manager. God, drag them out of this building and restore the righteous. <laughs> Come on. Tell the truth, shame the devil. You have a couple good ideas of how he can answer your prayer. The only problem is, back to the praying for your marriage, what if God's response is, no, that's not how I'm going to fix this marriage. I'm going to fix it by giving you grace for his brokenness. Hmm. No, I don't want that. I don't like that. That's like mud and spit. <laughs> Come on now. The thing is, we want God to do it our way. And Jesus is like, I'm going to do it, but you got to let me work. I don't know why he did the mud and the spit. And let me tell you, no theologian can tell you. It was just a God thing. I can, give, can I give you Stephen's hunch? I feel like one of the reasons why Jesus spit in the mud and he took the mud and he put it on the guy's eyes is because that's how he made man in the first place. Remember back in Genesis? The Bible says that he took the dirt and he formed man. Now, I know I'm supposed to be politically correct and all that, but he formed man. The woman wasn't there. He formed man. And here's why. Because he didn't make woman from dirt. He said, no, she's too pretty for that. I have to fashion her, but I'm going to form him from... <laughs> now that... This, this is going to get me in trouble, but I'm going to step off on a limb real quick. That's why it concerns me when men are too pretty. <laughs> you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be pretty. There should be some dirty grittiness to you. I'm just, it's biblical. Like, <laughs> there got to be something a little rough and rugged about you. Somebody say it's biblical. I'm just saying. <laughs> Pray for me, I need help. But he made man from dirt. And I think when he took that dirt and put on his eyes, because remember, he was born blind. No one, this says later in this passage, no one in the history of the world had ever received their sight after being born blind. It was never done before. Everybody thought it was impossible. And I feel like Jesus was like, wait. I made, this is how I made you in the, you don't think I can remake you? I made you from dirt. I can remake you from something as dumb as dirt. Somebody say, make it practical. Some of us think that we're too broken for God to heal us. I've been through too much. You don't even have hope that God can restore you back to the sensitivity and the innocence that you had before you were abused, or before that divorce or that abortion or what. It's not even a dream of yours to get back to a place of trusting people the way that you used to trust before you were hurt. 
God says, you don't think I can reform every broken part in you? I am tired of church where we have to come and pretend like we have it all together because we're afraid that if people really saw the ugly parts of us, they'd kick us out the church or judge us or whatever it may be. Listen, we serve a God that sees every single ugly part of you. And hear me. He is not intimidated by the ugly parts of you. He's not intimidated by the ugly thoughts you have. He's excited because he sees it as an opportunity to show himself strong. I think another reason why he spit on the mud is that nobody can take credit for it. There's something about us church folks that we like to brag Like 21 days of prayer and fasting is supposed to be a time of humility seeking God. And somehow we turn it into, I fasted for 21 days. I haven't eaten in 40 days. I haven't missed a Sunday. I've been tithing since before I had a job. And here's the problem. It's because we think we serve a genie. That if I rub him the right way, he just spits out miracles and blessings. And God says, no, 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 no. You can't rub me to get anything out of me. I heal you. I move in your life. I bless you because I love you and I made you and I formed you. And it's not about you. It's about me demonstrating my love to the world. Let him work. Somebody say let him work. Let me say it this way. Stop freaking out when it doesn't go the way that you planned. Just because it's not the way that you planned doesn't mean that this church, we're going into our ninth year, and, and when I became the senior pastor, I had studied church planting for years and years and years, and there's actually some great wisdom on how to build a healthy church where people are being discipled. One of the things that they say is that you need a strong leadership team if you're going to build a great church. So from day one, I was like, man, I got to make sure I get some great leaders around me. And they said, one of the greatest factors of a leadership team meshing together are having people that trust each other. So you want to look for people that you have long established relationships with. So when I became the pastor of the church, first thing I did is I went to all of my ministry friends, people that I did Bible studies with and were friends with for decades. And I said, hey, this is a dream. This is what God's laid on my heart. This is what we're going to build. Will you join me? Y'all, they all said no. Every last one of them jokers. None of you, I'm sorry. <laughs> not one. Not, not one. Not one. And here I go back. God, they told me this is how you become successful in ministry. And God, if it's not working that way, will I ever be successful? He said, is it all right if I do it a way that you've never seen before? You just be faithful. You just do what I've told you to do and let me work. Year two of the church, an attorney named Temi Pope walked into the church and fell in love with what God was doing here. And now she's one of the executive pastors at Destiny Church, walked away from a law career to build the kingdom of, y'all, that does not happen. Our campus pastor at Baltimore, Jonathan Ball, walked away from an amazing music career. I mean, accolades and awards have worked with people that would blow your mind, but yet God found a way to bring the great leaders and the right people that we need to build this house. It may not be the way that you think it will go, but if you'll just let him work, he can work some spit. Oh, you gotta be real careful. You can't stutter on this one. You might mess the mess. (laughs) What did he say? All right, point number three, let's land this plane. So first thing is this, don't accept the guilt. Second thing is this, let Jesus work. The last thing is this, and you come land this, play the piano so I can land this plane. Just do what he said. Just do what he said. Y'all remember how I started the message, right? Would you let Jesus spit on you? Yes, if it worked. Y'all hear me. Jesus spit on this man and it did not work. You remember the story? Blind man, Jesus spits on the ground. He makes a mud pie. He puts it on the man's eyes and watch this. He said, go wash in the pool. Hold up. You're the creator of heaven and earth. You raised the dead, healed the sick, feed the five thousand, two loaves and stuff. And you're going to spit on me and I still can't see? If I wasn't going to be able to see, why just spit on me in the first place? Did the blind man say that? He said, go wash. And it says he went and washed, and he came back seen. I don't know about you. You can pray how you want to pray. 
when I pray, I want it done there. Am I the only one? Come on, be honest with me. How many people, your definition of breakthrough is instantaneous? <laughs> when I'm believing for a breakthrough, what I, if I was going to sing that song the way I want, God, I'm believing for a now. <laughs> huh? Can I tell you what else breakthrough means for me? God, I'm going to be over here sitting down. Let me know when you've broken through. <laughs> I don't actually want to do anything. I just want, no, no, no. Here's what I've learned. But until I can see, I just need to do what he said. Some of the greatest miracles you will ever experience in your life doesn't come from you tearing. It comes from you just doing what he said. Go wash. All right? Go wash. Forgive. All right. I'm going to forgive. Husbands, lay my life down for my wife as Jesus laid his life down for the church. I'm going to do it. Wives, honor your husband. Isn't it amazing how God gives us very simple instructions, but for some reason we don't want to do them? It's going to be mean. Don't worry. I'm going to run out the back door. You can't catch me. It'll be good. <laughs> Why is it that we never really grow up past 10 years old? Anybody with a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 13-year-old? You ever tell them, hey, can you go clean that up? I, I didn't make that mess. That's not my fault. I didn't do Just go clean it up. Hey, you need to be the first one to forgive. I didn't do that. I didn't. I, I didn't ask all that. Just do what I said. You need to lay your life down for your wife. Well, I mean, I'll lay my life down for her. She stopped walking all over me. I didn't ask you all that. Honor your, honor your parents. Honor, well, I'll honor them if they're honorable. I didn't ask you all that. Just do it. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Why don't I obey the simple things that he told me to? I thought about this. Can I give you a couple of excuses? One, because I'm just not listening. I'm just so focused on my own thing and my own world that I don't even really look to see what God has to say about this. He has something to say about everything. Another reason why I thought is because I think I'm right and I think he's wrong. I think my way is better, so I'm going to work my way instead of give his way a try. Can I give you the ult ultimate reason? I'm just not desperate enough. I just don't want it bad enough. Because when I want it bad enough, I'll take the spit. And I'll walk to wash in the pool. <laughs> Can you imagine how emasculating that was? You have another man's saliva dripping down your face. It didn't work. What happened to you? Shut up. <laughs> but he went and he washed. And he was the first person in the history of the world born blind that received his sight. I hear me. God has things in store for you that no one in the world has ever experienced before. But it is going to take Stephen Chandler getting over himself and how people view me and get to a place of desperation I say, if God said it, I'm going to do it. And I don't care what other people think. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful. You said in your word that even before we were born, when we were formed in our, ma in our mother's womb, God, that you had great plans and purpose and, and destiny for us. God, we're grateful that in spite of the pain, the setbacks, the bad decisions, God, that you still have great plans for us. Just where you are with your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you could pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Just give God a moment to make this time, to make this message personal to you. For each and every one of us, we all have an area of our lives. We, we be honest, we don't have the clearest picture of what God's best is in this moment. Just pray, God, give me a picture for your best in this area.
for many of you in this room and Baltimore County watching online, if you were to be honest, you don't truly have a personal relationship with the God who gives pictures. Maybe you're like me and you grew up in church and you know all the songs and the benediction and all that other good stuff, but, but there is a lack of personal intimacy between you and God. Or maybe you're one of those people that I said, you know, you just kind of ended up here and you weren't really looking for God. And, but in your heart of hearts, you know that there's something missing. There's some void that I can't fill. I'm telling you, it's God. And not only is it God, but he's in this room right now desiring to step into your life in a real way. All you have to do is invite him. If you're in here and you say, Pastor, I can't say that I have a real relationship with God, but I want him to be a part of my life. Right where you're sitting, you can make that decision. If that's you, can you pray this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for searching for me even before I knew to search for you. Thank you for dying on the cross so that all of my sin, all of my mistakes can be erased. Today, I surrender. I give you my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Come on, church. Can you celebrate for every single person that just made the greatest decision ever? Come on. That's a golf clap. Let's praise God.